podcast. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the day three of our Digital Innovation Summit. Today, we have three sessions. So this is the first session of the day. And after this one, we will have another one uh, at 1 p.m. And then we have a networking session uh, at 3 p.m. And that is when we're gonna announce, officially announcing the new degree programs that we have. Now this morning, we're gonna start with this session called Cyber Warfare in the Digital Age. And we are honored uh, to have David Kast and Daniel Garrier uh, with us and uh, as our speakers. David, who had uh, presented previously, and uh, David is the uh, chief, uh, it previously was the chief information security officer of IBM uh, Cloud, and currently serving as the vice president of cyber uh, and IT risk uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, Supervision Group. He has uh, spent his entire career uh, mostly in the financial in, um, industry. Uh, he has uh, been the uh, uh, Chief Information Security Officer at Elsevier and uh, also in uh, executive leadership role uh, at uh, a number of different financial institutions as well. Daniel uh, is uh, a lawyer by profession and uh, he's the co-founder of Law and Forensic and he uh, basically heads up the computer forensic and cybersecurity teams. Uh, he is a well-published um, author uh, in the cyber cybersecurity space and authoring over more than 200 articles and books and, uh, and well-cited as well. So uh, we are absolutely honored uh, to have both of you uh, helping us and joining us and sharing your knowledge with our audience uh, this morning. Uh, so David and Daniel, um, there you go. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, um, uh, Bruce. It's an honor and privilege. Uh, relevant background to today is I'm also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Law and Cyber Warfare. I also head up a global, Law and Forensics as a global legal engineering firm where we specialize in cybersecurity and um, cybersecurity aggressive aggression, aggressive acts by state actors against global private corporations and bridging those gaps. Um, we work both advising on the legal as well as technical pieces of those and managing these types of incidences and responses. With that said, I will um, let David um, chime in before we kick it off and hopefully uh, we'll figure out how we can share our actual slides. Yep, yeah, now I'll share the, the screen as soon as I get uh, permission to. So again, thanks for having us. Just keep in mind, this is gonna be a, an extreme intro to cyber warfare. This is something that Daniel and I usually spend a full semester at, at law school teaching, you know, from that aspect of it. So uh, we'll, we'll get started in a second here. This is the class we've taught, where I've taught you know, six years at Rutgers and Cardozo and, and elsewhere at law school. And David is 100% correct. What we're doing is covering an entire uh, semester. Uh, this is a very quick overview. With that said, I'll, David, I'll let you kick us off. All right, great. Thanks, for, thanks again for having us. And we've already introduced ourselves. So the key thing is, can everybody see the, the slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. So yeah, uh, the uh, first thing uh, is, you want to do the disclaimer, Daniel? Yeah, but I don't see all the slides okay. on the window. I see half of them. They're slightly off. But um, I think you zoomed in on them, David. But let me, I'll read the disclaimer since I memorized it. This is not legal advice, nor should it be considered legal advice. This presentation, the comments contained therein represent only the personal views of the participants, do not reflect those of their employers or clients. This presentation is offered for educational and informational uses only. Um, and David, I think we're still having some Zooming uh, screen sharing issues. Um, so can you see it? I can see the full slide. Yeah, everybody, it's too far zoomed in. If you go to view up at the top on the right on Zoom, 
and it says view options and you can use zoom ratio and it says fit to window on a great Mac, there may be some issues, but there we go. And it's a zoom setting. It's not the PowerPoint. Just set it. So let's see here. Hi, David, this is tech support, uh, if I may. Sorry, Daniel, to interrupt. Um, in this case, it is from David's side, I believe. If you would hit escape, that'll take it out of uh, slideshow. If you would, uh, we're going to try a different type of share because this seems something particular to this file that we won't be able to troubleshoot right now. So if you would um, stop the share briefly, or just stop the share, and then click the share in Zoom again, please. And this time, when you get that window that pops up, um, choose the, you're going to see it, a basic tab at the top and an advanced tab. Please click the advanced tab. Okay. So when I click on share for my PowerPoint right there. No, I'm sorry. This is within zoom. Okay. Um, the, the toolbar at the bottom of the screen, the, uh, the green. Actually, screen I'll icon. do it. I, I've got it as a PDF. Can you see my screen? Okay? Right, I see the advanced settings. Yep. My screen. Can you guys uh, see the screen? Daniel's kicked it in now. Okay. That one is sized Perfect. properly. Let's go with that. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, so what is the current state of international law as it relates to cyber warfare? Um, crickets, probably the best analogy if you wanted a one word summary of what the state of the law is. Unfortunately, the state of the law as it exists today is um, through treaties and norms. And we'll talk about this a little later, but there's no Geneva Convention of Cyber Warfare. And it's really, people have this, I guess TV maybe creates these misconceptions. There is no Geneva Convention of Cyber Warfare. There's no international unifying treaty. Um, I don't know, David, if you want to weigh in any further before we jump to the next slide. Yeah, we can, we can definitely jump to the next one. So... So with that in mind, internet, what role does international law play, David, sort of today in cyber, you know, and I'll elaborate a little bit further, but maybe you could weigh in from your perspective of when you're looking at it from your lens as prior roles at IBM, as well as the publishers, as well as the regulator day from the U.S. side, and then I'll weigh in as well. Yeah, no, thanks. It really, as you know, mentioned in the slide, is it it sets at, I guess, at least a common norm or a common ground of what's understood within the state or within the country, because when you get into it later, you know, what's acceptable varies significantly from a country by country way. And, you know, that obviously makes sense. Um, the, the world is a very big place governed by a very diverse set of interests that are operating. And if you, if you, you know, people often conflate a U.S. centric view, which is incorrect around cyber warfare, but it really provides, you know, if you want to look at it, cyber law itself is domestic law, and that's different than international law. So, so you know, and it's very important to realize that international law itself plays a different way through what they call norms and accepted practices of behavior between states. But with that in mind, I'm going to keep us going because we have a bunch to cover. And we just... Yeah, and even as, as Daniel mentioned, there's some current challenges to the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that are currently underway. So what we're looking at, besides us, my Zoom, a big picture of David, which I've now moved to another screen, um, is uh, what does international law really not say about cyber issues? Let's say about social media. That's a really hot topic of late. Um, social media and cyber has proven to be a very interesting and dynamic topic. And maybe, David, you can weigh in here, and then I'll follow on, obviously. Sure. Yeah, so again, when we talk about the international cyber law, there isn't really any international law dealing specifically with cyber warfare. 
where we see cyber coming into play is we usually under things like GDPR, under the California Consumer Protection Act, under you know human rights acts as well. And, and that kind of is a segue to you know when we talk about you know issues such as social media, when you think about things like propaganda and how social media is used, propaganda by itself isn't illegal. You know, there's a difference between you know promoting propaganda versus tampering with an actual election machine. Right. And, and so there's a there's a fine line on where a state is allowed to act, right? Espionage has been around for centuries, and you know it's never it's never been usually rising to a, what we call an act of war. There is a lot of regulation around the rules of engagement with respect to human rights, and there's privacy rights that are being created. Um, it seems like on a weekly or monthly basis around the world with, you know, but these are state driven rights. There's no international governing bodies of law besides the rules of war and et cetera. But with social media, people are sort of like they're inflaming and creating civil unrest and et cetera, or they're not letting this despot or leader post their tweets or whatever you know, that's interfering theoretically so a state can, you know, turn off that company's access to the system and technology. But we'll look at that in a bit more detail. So what, what international law not say about cyber issues, really about social media. Now there's, it runs the gamut and there's a lot of things to cover. So I don't, we're not gonna be able to get into all of them, but I mean, the practicality is, is there is no international law that regulates social media or frankly the internet. It's sort of the antithesis of what the internet is accompanying or attempting to accomplish. And I mean, there is a series of norms and various nonprofit agencies that drive this. But domestic law, without a doubt, you know, China has their privacy and security laws, so does Russia, because they all, you know, want to govern and monitor and control how Google is operating in their country, right? I mean, Google, I think at one point pulled out of China, didn't it, David? I think at one point in time, yeah. And you know, as you mentioned, there's more than 80 countries right now that have some kind of privacy law on their books that does have an impact to cyber. These are individual discrete states that are governing how a technology company can operate, which is distinct, let's be clear from a state actor, right? Google isn't seen as an agent of the United States government. I, you know, the best example I can come up with for you is, you know, there have been Kate, you know, classes where we, I've been teaching where people are like, Bank of America. And I'm like, no, Bank of America isn't the Bank of the United States of America. It is a bank, right? But people often conflate Bank of America with the bank. And, and, and you'll see this, you know, when, the Bank of America attempted to get a trademark in Iran. I believe they weren't successful in part because people presume that the Bank of America was the Bank of the United States of America, but it's not. It's a private corporation and it's not seen per se as an, you know, as an agent of the United States of America, nor is Google or Facebook under international law. But David, any further comments or thoughts? No, I definitely concur with what you're saying. With that in mind, everybody here has heard of the UN and they call them GGE. So it's a term worth knowing and it's a government, a group of government experts. So maybe David, you'll walk through sort of what the UN GGE is attempted to do here. Because remember, there are no international laws about when or how you can engage specifically around a malware attack as an example. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, getting together essentially the, the experts from representation from different countries and looking at it you know, across each country and figuring out, well, what's each country doing and trying to figure out, you know, what is the international law that would generally apply to cyber operations? Uh, you know, and we'll talk about what a proxy is and things like that. So that was one of the few areas where uh, there was common agreement of, of states are not to use proxies, so you can't contract with somebody else to do work on behalf of the government in a manner that's going to be, I guess, considered a cyber attack type point of view. You know, one of the key areas that they didn't agree on was that the law of armed conflict doesn't apply to the conduct of cyber warfare. And there's a couple interesting 
reasons potentially behind that. But when you look at it is, you know, all nations on some level conduct some type of cyber operations. Yeah, Daniel, you want to add to that? Yeah, and I think David's driving home a key point that we often tell companies as well. You cannot outsource to a third party your, your a cyber offensive operation and abdicate responsibility. In the same fashion, a private corporation cannot abdicate its responsibility to, you know, to the, its shareholders by simply hiring a bunch of military contractors, at least not under US law. Um, so, with that thesis in mind, I think David will build on it as we go forward. Yeah, but, and that um, kind of drives that whole hack back where there's been arguments on both sides of that, you know, of, you know, from, the, from the perspective of, you know, having organizations having the ability to hack back is usually, you know, frowned upon from that area because of the complexities that it introduces. You want to touch on that, Daniel, before we jump into talent? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if you think about the people you, you know, people that are in the class, right? If you think about some of your friends, Imagine them being author being allowed to authorize a cyber offensive operation against another state actor. Now here's where it gets interesting. What happens if, you know, when you think about a cyber attack, you have to recognize that the bad actors may be using someone else. So they may actually be a victim themselves of people that you think are hacking you. So this creates a really complicated problem for corporations or, um, and so you first can't hack back per se, it is a crime under US law and under international law, that's a question of norms if you're representing an actual state and engaging in these measures, depending on how your, your country, when I say state, I don't mean the United States, I mean an actual country interprets international law. And I think it's important everybody think of their friends and think, wow, do we want these people to actually be able to respond to a cyber attack by a state actor or a third party that you're not sure has actually done something. So it's, you know, this whole, and we'll get into hacking back in a few slides. Um, I think just in the interest of covering everything, we'll talk about Talent 2.0. So I was a contributing reviewer. I don't know what they call my official title in the, the publication. I was contributing to this treatise. This is probably the closest you're going to get to international law on, or agreement. The UN, while they attempted to do it, didn't nearly get as much traction as the talent team did. Not to credit Professor Schmidt, Professor Jensen, um, contributions from all over the world. And what it is, is, you know, they follow this thing called Chatham House Rules. So what is said in the room stays in the room. And, and, you know, this is rules versus commentary. And it's very important. There is no international law, but what they did is they took all of these, the, what they call a restatement of law, which is when you take all of these different things and you interpret it. Uh, Dave, if there's anything further you want to add to that? No, no, we can move on. So there are two main concepts, you know, in the interest of time, because we only have an hour. Um, you want to walk them through the high level concepts as we're going to dive deep, well, as deep as you can in an hour into both of these concepts. Sure. And, and you know, with, you know, respect to the United States, there's what we call juice ad bellum and juice in bello. And, and really it is the law of going to war versus the laws governing war when you're actually in war. You know, from that, that point of view. So the activities that you can take leading up to it being an act of war are very different than some of the laws governing when you're actually in a, a state of war. Right. And, you know, it's also important to remember this is relative to the state that is actually interpreting these laws. The United States may interpret the laws differently than Russia. Those are two we're going to take a quick glance at today. But let's talk about it in detail. So with that in mind, juice ad bellum to start with. The cyber use of force. Let's start with the basic principle so everybody understands the current state of affairs. No state has officially ident been identified. Any malicious cyber acts is violating the UN Article 2 for use of force threshold. And we'll talk about that in a 
the key takeaway is nobody's actually been found by the United Nations to engage in what an active war via cyber intervention. It's still, and these are a lot of things that have happened. I mean, the Russian election meddling, WannaCry, New York Times, the Stock Exchange, Sands, Estonia. I mean, there are a lot of the Saudi Armco, and we'll look at some of the others right here. In a, you know, when we look at what happened in May of this year, last, last month, kind of crazy. We'll start at the bottom. On May 4th and 5th, the Norwegian energy technology company, Wole, or you or I'm not sure how you say it, Norwegian. It sounds better in Norwegian, but was the victim of a ransomware attack. Now, here's where it gets interesting. And you'll understand why in about a couple of slides, the attack resulted in the shutdown of water and water treatment facilities in 200 municipalities. Think of the impact that would have in your country or your state or wherever you're attending the Zoom from, affecting approximately 85% of the Norwegian population. That means eight out of every 10 people had water issues in a country. It sounds like a pretty big situation there. Look at May 14th. The Irish National Health Services effectively stopped operating because of ransomware attack. Now, in the United States, there are a lot of different hospitals and healthcare services. I'm told that the HSC in Ireland is the go-to health service for the country. And upon discovering the attack, the government of Ireland shut down the entire HSE system. And they believe it's purported to be operated by a Russian-based cybercrime group. Now, let's look what happened May 24th. That is, what, three weeks ago? Hackers gained access to Fujitsu systems and stole files that belong to multiple Japanese government entities. So far, for our Government agencies have been impacted. That seems more like espionage. The others may, you know, may or may not be seen more to having an impact on the operations of the state. But David, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, as, as Daniel mentioned, and you know, you just go back any month, you've seen, you know, the UK healthcare system has been ransomware. There's been significant cyber attacks, essentially, whether it's ransomware or, or whether it's a different type of attack for months going on now. And part of the challenge is, is, you know, what constitutes a use of force? Is it loss of life? And part of the challenge that we'll speak to later is it's very hard to equate the equivalent of how does kinetic of force apply to a cyber attack? So in other words, when can you exchange missiles based on a, you know, a cyber type of attack? If you do have any questions, please, you know, feel free to submit them in the Q and A channel. So when you look at cyber attacks under the law, you have to effectively evaluate different thresholds of what rises to this harm. Uh, David, you want to walk us through this? Oh, sure. So yeah, so the key you know, thresholds, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in detail, is you know, what constitutes an armed attack? So, you know, in traditional warfare, we think you know, obviously bullets, missiles, you know, grenades, things like that, typical. Uh, weapons of, of mass destruction. But now with some of these cyber attacks, where as Daniel mentioned, where you're shutting down, you know, healthcare systems, shutting down water, or we saw, you know, attacks on critical infrastructure in the US, at what point in time is there loss of life potentially involved in that where it could consider the equivalent of an armed attack, which is one of the challenges. The other aspect of it is, you know, what constitutes an actual use of force? When can you actually use force against another nation? And what are, you know, prohibited acts, uh, whether it, uh, under warfare or not, and then what would constitute an unfriendly act, which may not be prohibited, just kind of operates in the gray area. And I think that if you wanted to look at it more practically and effectively, you know, there's a difference between the Fujitsu incident where things were stolen and files were stolen versus the Norwegian incident where water wasn't able to be delivered or water facilities to the citizens of a country. And then there's the in-between about Ireland. And that's sort of an in-between area. And it would probably, maybe, did you want to touch on the fact of, you know, espionage in, in general, the, the legality? Yeah. 
Yeah, espionage has uh, been around and happens all the time. The United States is a prodigious, you know, the difference is, is how does espionage benefit the state? The difference between the China and the United States is that China may use espionage to advance the interests of the state's manufacturing and, and country-specific development versus the United States where, you know, you can't imagine that the, hypothetically speaking, that the NSA would go hack somebody and then share that with their competitor competition in the United States, right? In other countries in the world, it, the relationship between the state and the private sector because of the way their government works, right? Because of the regime that they operate under, it's much more, it's much more widely accepted for them to share that information. But it's not an act of war. I don't know, David, if you'd like to weigh in further there. I, I think that's definitely a, a good description of it. That maybe David, let's get into some of the weeds here on uh, the law itself. And I know this has got everybody at the edge of their seat, their seat, you know, Zoom excitement here. But maybe David, you can walk us through Article 51. Sure. So when we talk about Article 51, it's really looking at, you know, the right of a nation to defend itself from that, that point of view. So there isn't any law that prohibits uh, a nation from self defense. You know, so in other words, if someone you're you know, out an armed incursion against another nation state, that you know nation is entitled to take the necessary actions to defend themselves from that point of view. Doesn't mean it, they can take an offensive operation, and we can talk about that I think a little bit later where we touch on that. There's a difference between defending yourself and and taking in what would be considered an offensive type of operation. Daniel, did you want to add to that? One of the things I did want to point out is that Article 51, if you if you notice, this is international law, and it says shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense. So you have the right to defend yourself. So now this gets interesting. Is a ransomware attack that impairs the ability of a hospital system to operate require that a state defend itself? You know, that, that's an issue to be determined. You know, I would argue that there, it would depend on the context of the situation. There's probably, you know, and the state from which it's happening within. But that clearly says if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations, until the Security Council takes measures necessary to maintain international peace and security, which we all know may take some time, um, Measures taken by members in the exercise of this right of self-defense shall be reported to the Security Council and shall not in any way affect the authority and responsibility of the Security Council. So if you think about it, there's a major cyber attack. It impairs the ability of the Norwegian water system, hypothetically. According to this statute, right, they are required measures taken by the members in the exercise of this right. So the Norwegians would have to report it to the Security Council. Most importantly, the statute differentiates it shall not affect the authority and responsibility of the UN Security Council to take any time such actions as it deems necessary in order to maintain or restore international peace and security. This is a hot, so the water system is broken. It's not working. The Norwegians decide, or uh, this country acts, decides to respond. It responds, and maybe they over respond. And they, they, so there's levels of countermeasures that are permitted, right? If you take off the water system, that doesn't entirely need to launch a nuclear bomb, right? There's a res international norms of what is considered a res uh, an, a, an, a, an a, and a, a fair is maybe not the right, I don't want to get into the legal nuances just because we don't have the time, but there's a, a dance, so to speak, of what's an appropriate level of behavior for response. But the UN Security Council can drop in anytime it wants and respond to help preserve that order. And it's worth noting that because, I mean, and then, so now let's look at how the United States interprets this. So there was this executive order that just came out of the United States. Um, and we are, uh, 
we will answer the questions in a, in a in a minute or two. We'll save questions for the end. I promise you we'll save 10 minutes and we'll get through as many of them as we can. This is where it gets interesting. In the United States, international law, people think, oh, an executive order was issued. It's going to influence international law. No. All an executive order influence is doing business with the executive branch. Now that, that, that's a lot of people and a lot of companies, don't get me wrong, that has a lot of weight. The United States government is a very big buyer of stuff. But one of the, and this was May 12th of this year, Biden announced this because of colonial, solar winds, JBS. I mean, something, I think McDonald's is this morning, yesterday was, I don't know. You name it. Something's in the news now every day. It's just getting more prolific. I mean, CNA paid $40 million. I mean, it goes on and on. But there are some very clear indications. And just quickly at a high level, it, this executive order creates new IT security rules for federal contractors. Not every company in the United States is federal contractors. It also requires federal agencies to implement additional IT security measures. Right, but that's not everybody, it's just the federal agencies. Now, theoretically, there's such a big buyer in the marketplace that may influence the marketplace. And then it sets standards for commercial software that is sold into the executive branch, right? And because the government is such a buy, big buyer of software, rest assured this will likely have a fairly substantial impact. And then most interestingly, it creates a national review board that the United States can review it. Now, why does that matter? Under international law, if a national review board finds that a cyber attack was indeed an act, you know, what is the mission or authority that they have been authorized to execute against? What is the national review board? Because these statements now become official positions in the United States. I know, David, anything you want to add to that before we jump in? Just a little more about sure. the U.S. piece? Yeah, no, definitely. And as Daniel mentioned, it really creates the norms. And part of the challenge also is when you look at you know, critical infrastructure, some of the challenges of the when, you know, is it an act of war? Is it not an act of war? From the perspective of within the US, most of the critical uh, infrastructure is actually owned and operated by private US corporations. Whereas in other countries, a lot of times critical infrastructure is a direct arm of the government. So that is a, an additional challenge that kind of creates a gray area of that. Okay, so is an attack on the, the pipeline an attack on the U.S. or an attack on that corporation? So there, there are some nuances to it as well. And as Daniel mentioned, you know, executive orders are not law, you know, from that perspective. So there is a difference in that space. Executive orders can be included and incorporated into law and involve law and other things, but they're not per se law out of the box. They have to it's a little more complicated, but if we keep going, right, and just look at, you know, the U.S., there's this expanding view because I think the United States under Obama recognized digital infrastructure and this distinction David was drawing. And what they were, the distinction they were drawing is, um, David pointed out, Colonial Pipeline, that it's a private corporation. Think about that. So they took offline the ability of 45% of the, what was it? Was it 45%, David? You're on mute. Yeah, no, I, I believe it was about, yeah, it was a significant portion. Yeah, on the Eastern seaboard. Um, will be treated as they should be as a strategic national asset. Now, what is the implications? Protecting this infrastructure will be a national security priority. We will ensure that these networks are secure, trustworthy, and resilient. We, being the United States, being as President Obama at the time, meaning I, the leader of the United States, the royal we will deter, prevent, detect, and defend against attacks and recover quickly from any disruptions or damage. Now let's think about Colonial Pipeline. Maybe David, just quickly, and I'll jump to the next slide, walk through Colonial Pipeline from this viewpoint. So exactly, so why we're transitioning. So when you look at it, you know, it's core critical infrastructure supplying fuel, you know, for out a whole Eastern seaboard. So what that what does that mean when it gets shut down? You know, we saw the gas shortages, but what about the institutions that require that to backup generators, 
uh, and things like that. So at one point in time, does that rise to where there is a impact to the, I guess, government as a whole to effectively operate? And if we look at the slide here, right, the experts, you know, know the current standing on our internet is unclear as to when this, this turning point is. Is colonial pipeline, would that rise to the level? Arguably not, but President Biden did make a phone call or two, from what I heard, to his Russian counterpart and um, did, and <laughs> there was some involvement there and it did impact operations in the United States. The critical factor that experts generally believe is whether the effects of the cyber operation are as distinct from the means used to distinct from the means used to achieve the effects were analogous to those that would result from an action otherwise qualifying as a kinetic armed attack. So what does that mean? So if you have these oil pipelines, right? And they go offline because of ransomware. So oil is no longer moving down a pipeline. What does that mean? You know, that would result from an action otherwise qualifying as a kinetic armed attack. Does preventing the flow of gas in the United States rise to that level? You know, they didn't blow up the pipeline. They just made them unoperational for some money. That's one way to look at it. The other way is to look at it, people got shot and killed over the gas at gas stations in North Carolina. Right? I mean, people, violence incurred and there was panic and other things. So it's a gray line. And it, this, the current international group of experts agree that a cyber operation that seriously injures or kills a number of persons or that causes significant damage to or destruction of property would satisfy the scale and effect requirement. So if Colonial Pipeline had gone on for, let's say, a whole month, I bet you would have seen that scene as a cyber armed attack from the United States position. And the United States would have responded in kind. Um, but I'm posturing here and I, I'm not the leader of the free nation and I'm not, you know, I don't have any real decision making authority here, but it's important to notice that if there was no gas flowing on the eastern seaboard. There simply aren't enough trucks to move that through the pipelines to the gas station. But David? Yeah, no, and, you know, we've seen the hospital attacks where there has been direct loss of life attributed, you know, from those cyber attacks and things like that. And it still, you know, hasn't risen to that level. Now, you know, keep in mind, each, you know, nation state views this very differently. Some nation states have, you know, returned, you know, essentially used kinetic force against, you know, cyber types of attacks. And again, it varies, you know, differently according to the, the rules of engagement of that nation state. Oh, that's an excellent point, David. So let's keep it moving here in the interest of time. Cyber in conjunction with armed attacks. This is a little different, right? You hack me, I bomb you. That's one operation. But Dave, maybe walk us through this slide here. Sure. So this really speaks to, you know, some of the, you know, the, the incursion back in 2008. But we've seen things like this even within the past couple of years through other you know, countries from that aspect of it. So when you look at what happened in August 7th of 2008, so Russian intelligence was accused of releasing instruction to a Russian hacker community ahead of the attack on Georgia kind of, and again, this talks about you're not supposed to use outside parties to, to conduct you know, a government type of operation. So from that aspect of it, Georgian banks, telecom networks, news agencies, they were all hit down, hit and shut down by an onslaught of hacker attacks from that point of view. And then shortly within a day after those attacks were launched, you know, planes started actually bombing and troops started moving, you know, from that aspect of it. Maybe what that means, it was a precursor to the actual coming attack. Yeah, so were they actually... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying that yeah, that actually directly inhibited their also in on some areas to their ability to defend themselves. Right. And think of what that means. In your country, all of a sudden you lose all ability to bank, use the phone and everything else, and then they invade you. That's a pretty clear cut line. So let's look, we mentioned this earlier, David. Maybe you can walk us through Article 2.4. 
Sure. So Article 2.4 really speaks to the fact that you're supposed to refrain in their relations from the threat or use of force, you know, against uh, any other sovereign nation state, you know, from, from that point of view. So you're not supposed to take offensive action against your neighbors or any other nation state from that point of view. Yeah. You know, like they say in the schoolyard, don't fight. No. I mean, this is a little different scale, but unless or in any other inconsistent with the purposes, but then let's look at what it says. There's no authoritative definition today for the threat or use of force. You know, neither, you know, non-destructive, you know, people have used espionage and social media to do these things for years, right? Now, let's be clear. If you look at Article 2.4, you don't see economic harm being included in that statute. So just because people lose money isn't going to be sufficient under the UN Charter today. Now, when deciding whether to characterize enter operation, including a cyber operation as a use of force, the severity, the immediacy, the directness, all of these things will factor into the conversation. Let's look at some cyber uses of force. Yep, and, and Daniel's transition to that, I would just add that, you know, the, the economic harm has been significant to uh, somewhere, and you're talking about damage into the billions in some cases that, that you know, some organizations have withstood. Uh, 1.3 billion was for the Merck, Mondelez, uh, hundreds of millions, FedEx, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? This isn't chump change we're talking about anymore. So the economic harm is fairly severe, right? I mean, what is the economic impact of solar winds? It's TBD, but it's pretty big. Um, but let's look at some more publicly disclosed and delineated examples. The Israelis shut down Syrian air defenses. That probably is deviating into more the you know, because there's there's this retorsion, there's this concept of, of what you're allowed to do to respond and, and what rises to it, an actual act. The Ukrainian power plant attacked by Russia in 2017. Russia basically took offline power plants in the Ukraine, causing massive loss of power, similar to what Norway just experienced with their water system. The difference between Norway and the Ukraine is Norway, they believe it was tied to ransomware. And so you can't automatically assume because it's ransomware and it's sophisticated that it's a state actor or somebody. That's why Colonial Pipeline may not even be an active war, even involve it, right? It could be just a bunch of greedy Russian, sophisticated, you know, criminals that are elected to say, hey, look, this pipeline doesn't have good security. Let's, you know, and whoopsies, it turned out we made a boo boo, as they say. And you know, that's where, so it's important also to look at who the actor is and the involvement of the state. But David, any other comments? Sure. I mean, as you were saying, you know, proportionality of, of you know, can, can you do like for like uh, is definitely one of the measures of it. And the other complexity, too, is when you look at things, you know, like Sony or, or things like that, where it was a corporation that was taken out for a long period of time, you have to look at that, you know, if the government is going to respond, just like you know, when you cross somebody's airspace, there's only certain ways into other countries where you're probably going to have to traverse. Did, did you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, it gets a little tricky, right? The internet's a series of pipelines, right? So if you're doing a digital response, right, you know, you don't usually get a respond to a cyber attack with physical means, right? It's a level of, you know, what is an appropriate response. Um, but in the interest of time, David, I think we got to keep it moving, just staying on time. Okay. If you look at the UK AG, right, just looking at the United Kingdom, right, it's very clear their position. It's the Attorney General's statement. If a hostile state interferes with the operation of one of nuclear, our nuclear reactors, resulting in widespread loss of life, the fact that the act is carried out by way of a cyber operation does not prevent it from being viewed as an unlawful, unlawful use of a whole force or an armed attack against us. If it would have breached, would be a breach of international law to bomb an air traffic control tower with the effect of downing civilian aircraft, then it will be a breach of international law to use a hostile cyber operation to disable air traffic control systems, which this is the important part, which results in the same ultimate lethal effects. He's basically saying, you mess with our infrastructure, we reserve the right to respond with physical or kinetic force. 
and the United Nations Charter and Intervention, Article 27, there's nothing contained in the charter that author, shall authorize the UN to intervene in, that are domestic jurisdiction of any state or require the, the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present charter, meaning that you can't go to the UN to complain. They're not the arbiter there. Uh, but it's also it doesn't are, you know, in prejudice their enforcement measures, which they have. So this is referring to this, this is what they're talking about. There's a rule prohibiting interventions in the domestic affairs of state, both under Article 27 of the Charter and in customary international law. Meaning you can't just stick your nose in another country's business. Now I know me being from the United States, that may seem a little paradoxical, but the truth is, is that's the, the current sitting norms of the law. Now, Espionage is perfectly permitted and legal, but it goes on to say this prohibition means that any activity in cyber space which reaches the level of such an intervention is unlawful. That's great. However, any activity of this nature by a state could only become permissible in response to some prior illegality by another state. So you can't just respond willy nilly. This is why ransomware by states, you know, criminals versus state sponsored criminals versus the state is such an important distinction. And if you conflate the two, you're really going to end up in a really unfortunately bad position, right? People in the United States and elsewhere in the world think, oh, ransomware, because we call it panda bear or we call it panda or bear or something, we conflate it with the state. But just because someone is from a particular state doesn't mean that that state is sponsoring or supporting that. But, you know, prohibited interventions, I think the best way to look at it, you know, I, I don't know if we have enough time here, David, I really want to touch on this concept of sovereignty. So I'm just going to move us right into sovereignty. You want to kick it off? Sure. So, you know, th this is really, you know, when you took it, sovereignty as far as you know, it's to, to speak specifically to the rights of that nation state and, and looking at it of, you know, they're entitled to exercise control over their territory and to be able to act on an international level from that point of view in order to protect the territory and its people. And, you know, that, that's where some of the challenges, as Daniel mentioned, you know, with the internet being a pipeline connected through so many different organizations, response is challenging from that point of view, but the nation has the right of sovereignty. They have the right to protect their space and their people. So, um, so I remember what Gary Corney, a colleague of mine said, and, you know, I asked, if you want to know more about this topic, you can also look at, I published an article with Shane Reese, who's the Dean of West Point, um, on Harvard National Security Law Review on state and this, um, companies' rights to respond. But sovereignty is undecided. So, you know, subject to, you know, basically each state is applies sovereignty with respect to their cyber activities in a way that does not preclude cyber activities on the infrastructure and territory of another state. But, I mean, it's really sovereignty is a baseline principle of the Westphalian international order undergirding the abiding norms of what operate today, uh, the prohibition against the use of force in Article 2.4, or customary, customary international law on the rule of non-intervention. You know, but it's norms, right? There's no clear statement here. And I mean, when we look at it, it's a basic constitutional doctrine of the law of nations. And it's, it's, it's pretty clear. It says the collection of rights held by a state person. It's basically states get to do with it controls over the territory they own and representing their defense of their people. And with that, I mean, we're, we're. Well, thank you very much, uh, David and Daniel uh, for this awesome and uh, wonderful presentation here. Uh, that we learn quite a bit. And when you think about cybersecurity, it's not just a technology issue, right? And uh, so uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. So what we're going to do is that we're going to open up the uh, forum uh, for Q&A. So I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Crystal, uh, to uh, help to facilitate the uh, Q&A. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, David. And thank you, Daniel, for an awesome presentation. Um, so to start off the Q&As, the first question we have is, 
one drawback of international <laughs> laws is the enforcement body is is there anything in place to enforce anything sanctions restrictions or retaliations should a state actor commit a cyber assault on another nation so there is international law that says that you like look at russia invasion of the crimea right i mean it requires a lot of support and consensus um, to act. The tools are available, whether they're deployed or not is a completely different part of the conversation. The UN would sort of be that enforcement body per se, but it is it is unfortunately perhaps not as used as you probably would like to see it. Yeah, and there are also, we did feed on it, there are some like prohibited yeah, you know, we didn't have a chance to get into prohibited actions or things like that within detail, but you know, governments are pretty well versed at kind of how do you navigate the gray area from that aspect of it, because you kind of touch on a prohibited act of, okay, you can't bomb a hospital, you know, you can use social media or buy commercials to kind of influence things, but you can't tamper with election machines. Okay, the next question. Yeah, definitely. So how do laws differ between an individual party cyber attack versus a state sponsored cyber attack? Um, there's a whole discussion of this, um, but basically an individual is committing a crime under the law of their country and will be held accountable under the law of their country if they violate the other. So, for example, there were the United States extradites criminals or hackers that cause harm to US based corporations. They get charged in the United States. They then seek the, those individuals to be returned to or extradited to the United States for standing trial for their illegal activity. If you represent the state, they're not returning anybody. If you look at there were some very large hacks by Chinese actors where the FBI put up these slides, you know, put up these profiles of. Chinese military operators, the Chinese government wasn't going to send those military actors back from China to the United States because they were representing, in theory, the act, you know, or had an affiliation with um, the Chinese government and vice versa, same for the United States. Next question. Sure thing. Um, if companies are unable to respond to attacks by going on the offense, how is it that companies like Microsoft can take down botnets? Some of their activities could be considered offensive work. Ah, so this is a this is again U.S. domestic law influencing international law. So what happens is is you can go into court and seek takedown orders or notices, and I'm sure David can speak to this as his prior role as chief security officer at IBM and elsewhere. But the United States government, if you operate and operate your company under the jurisprudence of the United States, the United States can, or Microsoft can seek relief from a U.S. court to take down things that are impairing or harming Microsoft's operations or those of its customers. And now, David, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I just, yeah, I, I concur with what Daniel said, because in most of those cases, when you're looking at those large botnets, there's going to be activity in areas where we have direct relations with those other governments who will have the ability to, to act on it. We may not be able to take down 100% of it, but it, there will be the ability of working with law enforcement to be able to. And Microsoft is following U.S. law. Right? They're not violating U.S. law. They likely have gone into a court and have sought permission to do said activity. Okay. Um, so the next question we have is, the FBI has taken the position that bad actors in the cyber warfare shouldn't be rewarded, but this position seems almost irrational for businesses unless the FBI has identified a soft target to exploit hear of accordingly. Example, can you shade, shed some light on the FBI's resolution and what they should resolve with? If that makes sense. Um, <laughs> I can't speak for the FBI, um, but I, I think the best way to look at it is the FBI, FBI is one uh, law enforcement agency within the United States. And um, you're talking about ransomware and paying ransom and back and forth. Um, the FBI sees anybody that's a victim of ransomware, anybody that's 
hit by a ransom attack to seen as a victim. All right, that's the key takeaway. Whether or not you pay the ransom or not, this is a complicated issue, but at the end of the day, corporations and people lose sight of the fact that CEO and the board have a fiduciary duty to the corporation, not to the state. So if it's in the company's best interest to continue to make money and not fire 100,000 employees, you know, you're probably going to do what's in the best interest of the company. And some, you know, that has to be distinguished from the best interest of the United States. And it's not illegal to make said payments today. So, I mean, again, it's a complicated issue. Well, David said at the beginning, we took an entire semester right now and I've jammed it all in into a single hour. So, I mean, it, you know, this is an entire lecture itself, but it's a great conversation discussion about because there's ethical issues and other things that go back and forth, but don't forget U.S. corporate law. Right. Yeah. And treasury guidance. I mean, you know, as you know, we talk about ransomware and things like that, obviously nobody really advocates paying it. As Daniel mentioned, there's circumstances that need to be considered. You also need to be, you know, consider things like the U.S. Treasury guidance that's been put out of the, you know, do you know whether or not you're paying a nation state actor versus a random criminal? That's an excellent point. But that's an important consideration because there's... Yeah, because the United States government said if you drop $10 million to Al-Qaeda, we're going to hold you strictly liable for any harm that comes out of that and penalize you accordingly, right? So that's where the U.S. government has straight told corporations, if your payments of ransom will fund terrorism, that's a non-starter and we're going to hold prosecute you. We reserve the right to hold you strictly liable for criminal and civil violations, right? So you have to use companies like Anchain or Chain and Al... You know, probably more like Anchain, to actually do your diligence to make sure you're not funding terrorism. Uh, next question. Yep, and I think this will probably be the last one we'll have time for. Um, so the question is, what is the point of the US creating all these restrictions on what is considered an act of war? Isn't the final call made at the DOD and the White House, no matter what international rules or experts say? <laughs> cutting to the chase, are we? Um, it's a lot more complicated than that in some sense because, of the, yes, at the end of the day, the executive, the leader of the United States, up to a point, he does need authority from Congress for certain acts of war, right? Again, this is a whole class in itself. But I mean, what is considered an act of war? Remember, don't stoke, remember this old Ada Dodge, don't throw stones at a glass house, right? So the United States needs to be make rules that won't also make it per se accused of war crimes or other things right so it, it's something that has very serious long-term implications what you know you throw a rock in a in a in a pond it does something you throw a boulder in a pond you got a different reaction so you gotta it, it's complicated and the white house has a certain amount of authority to command the dod but it is not such a clean line and what's appropriate and retorsions and all these other things so but excellent question it looks like we got many more coming but i don't know if we're going to be able to get to Yes, a bunch just flew in, but due to time, I just want to say thank you to David and thank you to Daniel and everyone to, who has submitted questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I'm going to pass it back on to Bruce. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you very much, David, uh, for uh, this wonderful presentations and facilitating uh, the Q&A uh, answers uh, forum here. And uh, so I just want to remind everyone, uh, this is conclude the first session that we have today. Uh, we still have two more sessions uh, for today before we end the summit. The next session will be uh, at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so at 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we will have um, uh, Brian uh, Sabrinan uh, will be presenting and uh, he is an MIT faculty, MIT research scientist, and uh, he's gonna be talking about AI, right, in the context of a vulnerability and uh, cybersecurity and Internet of Things and the different type of uh, 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 AI-related and security-related kind of topics. And so that will be 1 p.m. And then at 3 p.m., we will basically have at all hands a maintained uh, networking session that we invite everyone come and to uh, mingle and to uh, join and meet our speakers. And But at the beginning of the networking session, uh, we will be um, basically um, having a official announcement uh, for the new master degree that we are launching uh, today. So uh, please come to join us at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. 
Um, thank you very much for uh, participating and attending the session. Uh, David and uh, Daniel, thank you very much again. Uh, see you all thank later. Thank you for the opportunity and privilege. Um, and hopefully you all uh, can participate and attend classes downstream. This is a fascinating topic that is constantly changing. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you to Bruce and your team. Have a good day.